Uh, it is I that must thank you to, for inviting me to be here again. It is with great pleasure that I'm here back uh, home, I could say. Um, it's really nice to be among familiar faces, among uh, former colleagues, and to discuss um, this topic. I would like to thank also to uh, Katja Sprantz, Felix Riesel and Benjamin Kawitska. I'm sorry if I misspelled your name for all the help and guidance that uh, they provided me um, in my way he back here. So uh, about my talk. Uh, when Professor Gephardt and Jan Suntrup invited me to discuss the architecture of Supreme and Constitutional Courts, I thought to myself, hmm, what, what shall I say about this issue? Why? Because, um, well, first of all, of, of course I gladly accepted the invitation and the challenge. And it got me thinking because my previous research on courthouse architecture concerned the courts of first instance or the lower courts, and particularly the family courts in Portugal. And at that time, I chiefly imposed myself the idea of not wanting to pay attention to the higher courts, especially because I wanted to know about the courts of everyday life and not those endowed with more respect or solemnity at the top of the hierarchical chain of judicial organization. Furthermore, when I started investigating the nexus between courthouse architecture and access to justice, which is in fact a fundamental right enshrined in many constitutions, the literature paid, in my opinion, too much attention to certain higher courts, as if only one type of building could transmit or give concretion to the law. However, supreme and constitutional courts cannot be avoided. After all, they do have extended powers and jurisdiction over the lower courts, but they don't simply apply the law, review and assure the, constitu the constitutionality of the laws. They can also create the law as you have written. For someone like me, Interested in family law, the cases of Loving or Obergefell in the United States, or the recognition of homoaffective unions in Brazil are extremely important. Now, to be frank, I've never been to the Portuguese Constitutional Court, and I suspect many lawyers haven't either, let alone the common citizens. This is due, first of all, to its own rules on jurisdiction. Secondly, we cannot forget that most constitutional courts have a really recent history and hence have been created or intensively reformed after World War II, and I'm thinking of Europe and elsewhere, of course, as part of a constitution-making or constitutional reform process following a period of dictatorship or totalitarian government, as in the Portuguese case. The constitutional court was only created in 1982, eight years after the Democratic Revolution of 1974 and six years after the Democratic Constitution of 1976. Nevertheless, I was asked to give a talk on the architecture of Supreme and Constitutional Courts, if possible, by analyzing comparatively several examples. Which examples? I decided that the Portuguese court would be one, as I'm more familiar with the Portuguese system. And the German court would be another, for its relevance, of course. Then, reading this conference program, I came to the conclusion that the Austrian and the Polish courts had to be cited too, alongside the European Court of Justice. I will also point out the, uh, the South African and the Constitutional Court of the Russian Federation. These related to the Constitutional Courts. As for the Supreme Courts, I will mention the Israelis one, the United States, the UK, the Brazilian, and the Icelandic Supreme Court. So, what is the relevance of thinking about buildings when it comes to courts? If we think about it, our life is lived inside and surrounded by buildings. As Peter Goodrich claims, buildings are the materiality of the social. Regrettably, court buildings still not play a significant role in most law and courts research. And yet, to assess the judiciary's built environment is extremely important, for it reveals the social practices, the values and governing principles that maintain the institution. According to Peel Haldar, architecture is thus the medium that serves to enforce the law by sacralizing it within space and place. Consequently, the court building is both a concrete and symbolic display of the law's authority and legitimacy. Using Gephardt's expression, as you just quoted, 
Court, ha court house architecture serves to petrify legal culture, expressing a twofold purpose to state the normative order of society and to reproduce the power of the law. If I'm talking too fast, please let me know. I usually have a tendency to accelerate. <laughs> Uh, so, it is thus remarkable, and here a first connection between architecture and Supreme Courts can be established. So, it is remarkable, as I was saying, that the current president of the Portuguese Supreme Court, in a public speech given in January of 2017, on the occasion of the inauguration of a new courthouse in the island of Madeira, has assigned such importance to courthouse architecture and buildings by saying that these are the spaces of cognition and recognition of the nature of power, of the exercise of citizenship and of liaison with the community and the citizens. As architecture evolved over time, so did courthouse architecture, which is in fact a quite recent and specialized type of archi architecture. We cannot forget the complexity of the courthouse architectural program. The building must incorporate, on the one hand, the ideologies and subsequent political, institutional, professional, cultural, symbolic and social representations on which judicial procedure is based. And on the other hand, as I've written with Marie Bells uh, in the chapter that you just uh, mentioned, uh, there is, they have to obey a precise functional plan with special requirements concerning volumetry, lighting, security, internal organization and accessibility. And this concerns all types of court buildings, from the lower to the higher courts, be it in the civil and in the common law traditions. So initial questions. Are these high courts really different from the lower courts when it comes to courthouse architecture? Or, as a senior judge has ironically told me, they are completely similar to those, but with just more pomp and circumstance. Otherwise, could there be a sort of constitutional and or supreme architectural iconology or identity? And could this presumed identity change or vary on the basis of a centralized or diffused system of constitutional review, which is linked as well to the civil or common law legal traditions? What's more, do they really represent the constitutions written in stone? Can the buildings of constitutional and supreme courts be referred to, and here I'm paraphrasing uh, <coughs> Professor Gephardt, to the petrified projects of society's constitutional aspirations? So having these questions in mind, and the intimate connection between constitutions and politics, and what might be the beliefs or the aspirations of the constitutional projects behind the courts, my analysis will be divided into the following categories. Location, transcendence, ancientness, future, brightness, materials and commodity. Location. As Desmond Manderson claims, how and what law means is influenced by where it means. So where are these courts located? In most cases in the capital cities. From Max Weber on, uh, courts have been associated with the urban dimension and the place they occupy in the geography of the cities. Thus, the act of choosing to locate the court in the urban capitals establishes a particular regime of semiotic relations that can only arise in the capital metropolis, where the other branches of power are also located. Brazil is an important example in this context. The capital city, Brasilia, is a clear political project in which former President Kubitschek's ideal of a new Brazilian society was institu institutionalized and made visible through Oscar Niemeyer's design. Brasilia is a capital city entirely planned and built ex novo in the late 1950s, and where the eloquent toponymy of square of the three powers, it's really interesting, uh, stands as a large open space between the monumental buildings representing the three branches of power. The Planato, Planalto Palace, the executive, the federal Supreme Court, the judiciary, <coughs> and the National Congress, the Legislative, as you can see, so. Supreme Legislative the Executive. Um, and the perception one has is that the open plan of the square follows without interruption from one building to the other, thus accentuating this intimate relation between law and politics. The Brazilian example is moreover illuminating of one such relation when one considers the phenomena of the judicialization of politics and the politicization of the judiciary. 
particularly when the proactivity of the Federal Supreme Court is questioned in relation to what is enshrined in the Constitution and the absence of activity on the part of the leg legislative. Thus, the special relationship established by both buildings in the piazza seems ironic. The architectural perception of continuity from building to building that I just pointed out is just really a trompe an optical is illusion, where the lack of dialogue between the three powers emerges as an actual interruption. The Israelis case is also important here. As Ram Kardi, one of its architects, has written, the relationship of the Supreme Court with the city of Jerusalem is not incidental. He wrote that in it we can see a small city, a miniature of Jerusalem, where the internal division of the court takes on the division of the city itself from Roman military times into the four axes of Cardu and Decumanus, hence establishing a line from the court to the parliament south and to the national square north and situating the court at the entry of the nationalist district in the west part of Jerusalem. Location in the city has also to, do, to be thought of when the staging of justice imposes itself onto the city and the citizens. According to the guidelines on the organization and the accessibility of court premises adopted by the European Commission for the Efficiency of Justice in 2014, courthouses are generally built in an elevated position. This could be pointed out in reference to the European Court of Justice, whose building stands on the plateau of Kirchberg, above the city of Luxembourg, requiring a special trip to get there. Now, transcendence. If constitutions are the normative superior order of the society, and now please ex really um, excuse me my uh, German. No, no, no. So they are the, the Grundgesetz, <coughs> They need a Grundgericht located in a Grundgebäude. Is that okay? <laughs> well, <laughs> that's what you, we are here for. <laughs> Hence the idea that supreme and constitutional courts possess a quasi-religious significance, or as Jacques Kumai would say, are buildings that represent the constitution's transcendence. So what kind of architecture would be able to transmit such connection? In the United States, <coughs> architect Cass Gilbert thought he had to search such, such association in antiquity, in the Greco-Roman temples, and apply it to the Supreme Court building. This Greco-Roman monumentality serves not only as a symbol of the legitimate as exercise of a strong political power over society, but its reference to the temple is the architectural manifestation of a secular attempt to secularize the judicial institution and the country's constitutional and legal cultures. As Rosenfeld asserts, American national identity is marked by its constitutional identity. And for the last circa 100 years, much of this is owed to the Supreme Court building and the ubiquity of its image. This temple-like court can be seen as the revered place for a religious-style constitutional court, as you've written. But even when architects seem to have used a different architectural grammar, as in the Brazil's case, what Nehemiah did was to take the elements of the Greek temple, the columns, the volume, the symmetry and repetitive use of shapes, and insert this classic language in the modernist aesthetics, thus turning the modernist imagery into a new classic or a new sacral. Carmi too, reporting to the, to the Israeli Supreme Court, declared that the use of a classic architecture expresses a harmony that is resistant to the passage of time and is thus capable of linking the present to the past in an entanglement of memory, influences and cultures transcending us all. In the Israelis case, there is another interesting element that evokes hierarchy and transcendence and is intimately linked to the superiority of the basic norm in Kelsen's terms, the, the pyramid, the copper-clad pyramid. This pyramid not only represents the constitution as the fundamental law, and the transnational character of the law, it also points to this court as the highest court in Israel. It also has a biblical reference to Absalom's thumb, thus reinforcing its sacredness. <coughs> Therefore, resorting to a revered architectural model serves to materialize belief in the hierarchy, power and authority of the fundamental law. So, ancientness. 
By looking at the past, architects like Gilbert, Niemeyer or Carmi sought for models. Society tends to ascribe history with erudition, to consider elderly people with reverence. Hence, by making buildings look old and historical, a relationship of trust is created. We have confidence in the institution. We endow more respect to these courts and what do they stand for. The US Supreme Court is from 1935, but it seems older, ancient. There is indeed a time-honored honored disguise in their architecture that man materializes the hierarchy of the Constitution and the stratification between the different courts and between the law, the institution, and the citizens. Furthermore, this association to an ancient design imprints <coughs> the court and the constitution with the characteristics of being everlasting, universal, and constant. Nevertheless, this ancientness prerogative is also found in buildings that were adapted to function as courts. The Austrian Constitutional Court is one example. It is currently located in a building designed in the 1920s to function as a bank, featuring neoclassicism elements. And as you can read from the court's website, architects Gotthilf and Neumann, with that architectural style, took inspiration from the forms of antiquity and invoked notions of consistency, security, and honorability, like Cass Gilbert did for the US Supreme Court. Now, the same happened in Portugal, when Palace Raton, built in the 19th century and featuring neoclassic design, was chosen as the constitutional court site. Actually, the Portuguese one is the most, um, how to say, um, less symbolic of them all, I suppose. Um, probably that's why it seems to be hidden in its uh, location. In other cases, the adapted buildings are historical and share their memories with those of the country's history. And now this is really funny in a sense because Previously, there was a discussion on the Russian constitution and on the Polish constitution sharing similarities. This is not, this is really not, a co uh, this is coincidental because I didn't know about that uh, discussion, but it's interesting that I put those pictures together. So, as I was saying, um, they, the, the, these buildings are historical and share their memories with those of the country's uh, history. That is the case with the Polish, Polish Constitutional Tribunal in Warsaw or the Constitutional Court of the Russian Federation in St. Petersburg. In both cases, the neoclassic architecture is almost secondary. It is the time-worn walls and their political, historical and social significance to the place and respective country, somehow suggesting a glorious past that made them the <coughs> suitable and honored locations in both cases. I'm, I hope I'm not saying some blasphemy uh, in my um, interpretation of these uh, buildings. Now, uh, history and ancientness feature as well in the United Kingdom's Supreme Court location and building created in 2009. As you can read from the court's website, the home of the Supreme Court is the former Middle Essex Guild Hall, an impressive building in an historic location directly linked with justice and the law for nearly a millennium. Thus, ancientness is as well linked to sacredness and transcendence, as the court site was already part of the Westminster Abbey Sanctuary Tower. There is indeed a powerful connection with Westminster Abbey. Actually, you can see the, the Abbey right here and the court. They, they are next to each other. So there is this powerful connection between the Abbey and uh, the court, as if the, the, the Westminster's uh, building, uh, the shadow of this building, could lend divine protection to the Supreme Court, itself located in a building resembling a Gothic church. Gothic architecture is furthermore intimately connected to the spaces of English justice, as in the Royal Courts of Justice in the Strand. Like Greco-Roman and neoclassic architecture, Gothic revival, or Nouveau Gothic, as it's sometimes called, uh, as a revered architectural style, imprints the court buildings with a clear message. Courts are overwhelming places in which users must reflect on the significance of the law. Now, knowing the past and looking at the future, nothing lasts forever, and law changes as do political regimes and with them the constitutions. 
Architect Baumgarten was aware of this, and he wanted to leave the message in the newly created federal German court located in Karlsruhe, the seat of German justice. It was the aftermath of the, of the Third Reich, and with the new constitution, power derives from the people, requiring that laws are made in a transparent process which citizens can control. And so the building had to be able to manifest this. That is why Baumgarten, Baumgarten avoided symmetrical arches, monumental columns, or other symbols of authority, which would not represent the people, but would only express power. Whereas neoclassic architecture expresses the belief in the eternality of legal regimes, modernist or postmodernist architecture fosters the belief that norms and legal regimes can be drastically changed. The 1969 building, recently renovated, has a modernist architecture, where glass walls are infused with symbolism, for there is a permanent dialectic look. From the outside into the court's inside, towards the interpretation and application of the law, and from the court's inside into its outside, that is, the world, the police, the public. Baumgarten wanted the building to come with transparency and dignity, a constitutional principle enshrined in the Grundgesetz. The dignity of a legal system completely different and distant from the previous one, and a new and transparent political pact. So it is interesting to relate Baumgarten's building to the building of the uh, Federal Court of Justice, also located in Karlsruhe, with its imperial dome and neo-baroque style. Its classic lines and monumentality are in sharp contrast with Baumgarten's ideals. And it's also interesting the relation between both courts, as the decisions from this court can be um, overruled by the Federal uh, Constitutional Court. Now, the Constitutional Court in South Africa is another example seeking to convey a transformative constitutionalism through architecture, architecture and internal design. The building designed by uh, Afri South African architects Masoyada, Makin and Uyghurs is noted too for its transparency and it doesn't feature at any marble cladding or wood paneling, thus avoiding any links to existing courts and the past they evoked. Like President Mandela said, Rising from the ashes of that ghastly era, the apartheid, it will shine forth as a pledge for all time that South Africa will never return to that abyss. So the need for a different and more inclusive representation of justice in a legal system in transition and where its exercise must be able to be recognized by everyone is achieved by enhance, enhancing the public dimension and value of architecture and art as evidenced by the building and the numerous artworks in it. Hence, in the South African case, parallel to the German court, architecture manifests a break with the past and reflects the, the aspirations of a more democratic, pluralist and multicultural society, society present and future. Brightness. Constitutions and constitutional treaties serve as a lighthouse, a beacon, a source of inspiration for national and supranational aspirations of democracy and the rule of law. Their courts must, must shine as well, not only in terms of the way they interpret the law, but also in the way their buildings are designed. One of the most interesting examples in this, con in this context is the European Court of Justice, especially Perrault's interven uh, intervention. It's not just about the two towers where the translators, all the, the translators are um, located. It's also about the foyer and the grand courtroom with its giant gold flower, all infused by this golden brown texture like, like sun. Those of you who are familiar with the Strangler song would recognize this, uh, the, the use of this metaphor. So the sun that shines bright, and so the court allows the sunlight in to create a warm ambience, Perrault explained. But there is more to it. The idea of a golden architecture may reflect the political dimension of the use conventions and treaties, with the, role, the, with the golden ring serving as a metaphor for the use aspirations of the, an encompassing community made of its member states, where sunlight illuminates the court judges when deliberating, trying to bridge together different legal traditions. The ring, 
is uh, actually where the offices of the judges, advocates general and deliberation rooms are located and where draft judgments and conclusions are prepared. So it constitutes in fact the heart of the jurisdiction. The Israeli Supreme Court light colored stone exteriors are also important in this context. When the stone is exposed to the sun, as the architect Carm, uh, uh, um, Cardier uh, wrote, it said that, he said that it gives back a warmer, lighter, and more humane light. So the, the whiteness of the limestone used uh, reminds everyone, and this is uh, the architect's words, it reminds everyone that this is Jerusalem, the law with the capital L that precedes time and legislators. Materials, and I was just talking about limestone. So materials are also important, and my title talks of stone. Stone is a common material in courthouses, be it limestone, marble, or volca volcanic basalt, as uh, in the Icelandic Supreme Court building. More than a common material, it is a noble material that can endure the passage of time. Stone is thus a symbol of eternity, conveying the belief that the law is everlasting. Contrary to stone, glass, um, which can be considered a postmodernist common material, can break. However, it is a recyclable material and it can be used time and time again, being a sign of change, hopefully for the best. It is also a revealing material and can thus mirror transparency, the transparency of the law or the transparency of democracy. However, as authors have argued, for instance, uh, Judith Resnick, also from the Yale University, um, the, the authors have argued that glass facades can be found in an array of buildings, like airports, for example. And so to equate it with the law's transparency and accessibility may not be correct. Then again, the gravitas of stone can also be found in many buildings which are not courthouses, such, a, such as public museums, libraries, or even banks. Equally important are wood, and the tree of justice is symbolically inserted in the wood panels in the courtrooms, and metal as well, copper and steel, for example. The buildings are thus infused with the five elements and the energies of the ancient Chinese calendar, wood, fire, earth, metal and water, the water that is near the Atlantic Ocean, near to the Icelandic Supreme Court. These elements discipline human relationships in relation to the cycles of the day and the seasons, like courts. And they, these elements also invoke mystique, sacredness, belief, like constitutions, that require a symbolic effort of constitutional belief in order to be effective. Lastly, commodity. Courthouse buildings and the different shapes or styles they've embodied are also import, imposed by architectural tendencies over time, as well as new trends in the globalizing market for courthouse architecture. International renowned <coughs> architects, from Nehemiah to Perrault, have been contracted to design these court buildings, turning them into architectural icons, which, along with a significant allocation of public funds, either to build, adapt, or renovate them, and the numbers are really impressive and expressive, reflect the status given to them by governments. I finally get to my conclusions. Trying to answer the initial questions, are these courts really different from the lower courts? My reply is, I would say nim, yes and no. <laughs> of course they are similar in what concerns the functional program, they have to be. But is pomp and circumstance that makes them different really? I think there is more to it. I don't believe there is a defined technology or identity and the buildings in my opinion do not reflect different constitutional systems. In neither common or civil law traditions, architects have turned to the architectural style of their preference, be it neoclassic, nouveau gothic or postmodern, the one they've considered it capable of conveying the significance of the institution. However, they have designed courthouses that have, in a major scale, contributed <coughs> to the validity of the constitutional order by creating buildings that turn to be recognized as high courts. 
By combining location, materials, architectural styles, trends and expertise, brightness or ancientness, they have turned these courts into meaningful places that do not fossilize political programs, but instead must foster society's constitutional aspirations, no matter how, how hard the present time seems to be. Thank you very much.